So, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready for the second uh, lecture of this morning. And uh, I'm very pleased to introduce to you uh, Professor Fabio Blandini. Uh, just a few information about uh, his activity. He took uh, a medical degree in the University of Messina, where he also specialized uh, in uh, neurology. Then he moved to the University of Pavia, where he specialized in biochemistry and uh, cl clinical chemistry. And uh, mm, afterwards, he started his work uh, in the laboratory of neurobiology of the Neurological Institute, Casimiro Mondino, in, uh, in uh, Pavia. And over the last, uh, maybe, more, maybe about 20 years, he did a lot of things in the field of neurological sciences, in particular neurodegeneration, and just tell you something I will give you uh, most relevant information. He was postdoctoral uh, uh, fellow in, in uh, Rochester, the Department of Neurology uh, of the University of Rochester Medical Center. And uh, then he was visiting professor uh, in the USA, first at the Emory University in Atlanta, and then uh, in uh, Pittsburgh at the Pittsburgh Institute for Neurodegenerative uh, Disease. Uh, now. His present position is coordinator of neurobiological research uh, at the Neurological Institute, uh, Casimiro Mondino, in Pavia. And uh, his main research interests are all in the field of neurodegeneration, and uh, in particular in the neurochemical, neuroanatomical, and neuroinflammatory uh, aspects uh, uh, of Parkinson's disease, also in uh, experimental models, and also for the evaluation of innovative therapeutic strategies. Uh, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological, also about, he was also working about stem cells, uh, also in clinical perspective, uh, and the analysis also of potential peripheral biomarkers of disease uh, in uh, uh, patients with a focus on a lot of mechanisms. And so, uh, I'm very pleased to invite uh, Fabio Blandini to give his lecture, please. Good morning. Thank you, Marco. But first of all, I would like to thank Professor Cosentino for, uh, for his kind invitation to this uh, beautiful uh, uh, autumn school for neuroimmunology. Uh, like Marco said, I'm, uh, I'm a, a mixed sort of, of figure. I'm a neurologist, but I don't see patients, so I don't do uh, clinical activity. I'm also a biochemist. So uh, in a way, this is, uh, can be a strange position, but on the other hand, it's a nice position to try and see all these things from a, a more global uh, perspective, trying to put together preclinical and clinical aspects uh, of research. In this case, research applied to Parkinson's disease, which is still my main uh, field of interest. So what I'm trying to, to do today is to, to tell you a story about Parkinson's disease. And uh, as all the stories, we need to split into chapters. So I would like to, uh, to give you a short um, a view of the epidemiological and clinical aspects of the disease. Then we will move on to the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease and then the main parts of my presentation, which will be about the pathogenic hypothesis of this disease. So let's start with epidemiology and clinical aspects. Parkinson's disease, as you know, is the second most uh, frequent neurodegenerative disorders in the general population. The first uh, disorder in this sense is Alzheimer's disease. The main risk factor of uh, uh, Parkinson's disease is age. Prevalence of Parkinson's disease is about 1% uh, at 65 uh, years. Then it, it increased quite uh, remarkably, going to a pointer. Then increases up to 3, 4, 3 5 percent over 85. This is a, uh, a nice graph giving you an idea of the prevalence of Parkinson's disease across the uh, various ages. So this means that uh, prevalence of this disease is increasing, and if you consider the, uh, that the uh, age of the general population tends to increase, that means that in the future, the next future, not in 100 years, we will be facing more and more PD cases, which we will translate in more in higher costs in terms of uh, uh, social uh, and uh, health care costs. So this means that we need to know 
more and more about the causes underlying uh, Parkinson's disease. This is the uh, worldwide distribution of Parkinson's disease. As you can see, it is a disease that tends to, to strike uh, more relevantly the uh, Western civ uh, industrialized um, um, countries. Um, there could be some explanation to these, some epidemiological biases, some uh, genetic or even uh, um, uh, health uh, uh, nutrition related uh, factors that may influence this distribution uh, that, but it remains the fact that this is a disease that tries, tends to uh, hit most prevalently the Western uh, countries. And as you know, we have uh, a lot of uh, um, important people suffering from Parkinson's disease. Some of them are still alive, others are no longer with us. Muhammad Ali, for example, as you know, Michael J. Fox, uh, the actor of Back to, to the Future, who, uh, by the way, has a, um, a private foundation which is currently the most important um, private foundation funding research for Parkinson's disease. Pope uh, uh, John Paul II, Salvatore Dali, Yasser Arafat, Mao Zedong. I don't know whether anyone recognizes this guy, Francisco Franco. And some people say that also this guy had Parkinson's disease. So there is a, a strange relationship between Parkinson's disease and, and dictators, which is something that maybe in the future could be worthwhile uh, exploring. So anyway, in terms of symptoms, uh, Parkinson's disease is a typical uh, uh, movement disorder. Actually, it's the prototype of movement disorders with this uh, uh, symptomatic triad uh, made of tremor, rigidity, and, uh, and bradykinesia. Uh, what has become more and more uh, evident in the last 10-15 uh, um, years is that this uh, uh, movement disorder triad is also accompanied by a number of non-motor symptoms which are becoming more and more relevant uh, not only from the clinical point of view but also in terms of the uh, neurobiological uh, um, substrates that uh, underlie these symptoms which include autonomic dysfunction, gastrointestinal dysfunction, sleep disorders, mood disorders, and cognitive defects. So what is uh, becoming uh, uh, more and more clear about Parkinson's disease is that PD is a uh, very complicated disease. And uh, here I'm showing you, for example, a, a recent uh, um, study uh, in which uh, the authors uh, uh, studied two uh, big cohorts of patients, one in, uh, in uh, uh, in Holland, the other one in Spain. Uh, the aim of this study was to try and characterize whether it was possible to uh, identify clinical subtypes of PD according to the presence of motor and non-motor symptoms. And uh, actually, the others were able to identify four subtypes in which the various symptoms were combining uh, differently. And the conclu conclusion was that uh, uh, the recognition that Parkinson's disease is a complex, complicated, um, uh, uh, clinical entity, it is important because it may have consequences for epidemiological studies and trials, uh, uh, which so far have considered Parkinson's disease as a homogeneous disorder, which is not. Another thing that we must uh, take into consideration, uh, thinking of the complexity of Parkinson's disease, is that uh, Parkinson's disease is a typical sporadic disorder, but in a 10-15% of cases, uh, we have familial uh, forms of Parkinson's disease which are linked to uh, specific gene mutations, the first of which has been uh, identified in 1997, and uh, that was a mutation uh, on the uh, gene encoding for alpha-synuclein, which has become, as we will see in the next slides, the most important protein in the uh, neurobiology of Parkinson's disease. So we have sporadic Parkinson's disease and uh, genetic Parkinson's disease, so the complex, the uh, um, picture of PD gets even more and more complicated. Pathophysiology, which means what happens uh, once the uh, disease starts to, uh, to develop in terms of uh, uh, neural circuits, neurochemistry, uh, neurobiolog neurobiological changes in, uh, in general. 
Well, first of all, uh, PD is a basal ganglia disorder. As you know, basal ganglia are a, uh, a set of uh, uh, neural nuclei which basically uh, stands uh, in functional terms between uh, the cortex and the mortothalamus. So we have the striatum, which is the main uh, uh, infrastructure of this uh, circuit, which basically uh, functions as a sort of funnel, so funneling all the inputs coming from the cortex, which, need, which uh, um, are the purpose of uh, initiating movement. Then uh, the signal flows through the, uh, the circuit. We also have an additional entry point, which has been recognized more recently, which is a subthalamic nucleus. So I don't, I'm not going too much into details, but what happens if everything goes uh, well, this signal is uh, uh, processed within uh, the, uh, the circuit, and then the output nuclei send the, uh, the result of this processing to the mortothalamus, and then from the mortothalamus back to the cortex, the loop is closed, and then we can uh, execute correctly our uh, voluntary movement. As you know, there are two main uh, uh, pathological hallmarks in, in Parkinson's disease, pathognomonic markers, which unfortunately can be recognized only uh, post-mortem. The first one is the, the generation of melanized dopaminergic neurons, which populates the substantia nigra pars compacta. So the pars compacta of the substantia nigra is the uh, main target of the disease. This is a typical uh, uh, picture coming from any neurological textbook. Uh, you can see here the substantia nigra in a normal, uh, this is a mes mesencephalic uh, uh, section. In the normal subject, this dark area is the nigra. In a PD subject, the nigra has disappeared. So you have the loss of the, uh, these black uh, neurons which are containing uh, uh, dopamine and, and melanin. Actually, uh, we lose uh, dominergic neurons uh, throughout uh, our life. We start losing these neurons, and we keep losing neurons uh, during our life. And you can see here the normal, the normal uh, decline in the number of dominergic neurons. But the uh, symptoms, PD symptoms, and we are speaking in this case of motor symptoms, uh, tend to, to manifest uh, only after these decrease exceed a 70-80% of the total of the dopaminergic neurons. So in normal condition, if this line, which is the normal decline, does not cross this other one, which is the, uh, the threshold line for the onset of clinical symptoms, we do not develop Parkinson's disease. If for any uh, reason, and which can be uh, any one of these, these are just obviously hypothetical, but uh, probable reason, this line at a certain point becomes steeper, then the line crosses this other one, and we have PD symptoms. The other typical element, uh, pathological element of Parkinson's disease, as you know, is the presence in the uh, surviving neurons of typical proteinaceous uh, cytoplasmic inclusions termed Lewy bodies. These Lewy bodies have a typical morphology, uh, ultrastructure, they are spherical, they are uh, eosinophilic. They have a central core um, made of granular aggregates surrounded by a peripheral uh, halo made of fibrils and neurofilaments. And the main uh, constituent of Lewy body is alpha-synuclein. So we see again alpha-synuclein. We will see uh, synuclein again uh, uh, throughout the presentation because, as I told you before, alpha-synuclein is the, uh, the queen. I was about to say, of Parkinson's disease. Uh, what is this alpha-synuclein? It's a small protein, uh, mostly localized in the cytoplasm and in uh, presynaptic terminals. It comes into three uh, isoforms uh, with different numbers of uh, um, amino acid. The, the form with 140 amino acid is the most frequent in, uh, in the brain, and uh, it shows uh, uh, an alpha helix structure. At a certain point, uh, alpha-synuclein starts to aggregate 
and it goes through a, a serial, uh, uh, serial number of steps in this uh, um, process of aggregation through monomers, uh, uh, oligomers, then it starts to organize in protofibrils, uh, mature fibrils, and then we have the final form, which is the uh, Dilovy body. Uh, we don't know very much about alpha synuclein, but we know a few things that have become clear in the, in, um, in the last years. And uh, in, in physiological terms, so alpha synuclein, uh, uh, this is, is something that you have keep to keep in mind, is a normal protein. Uh, every once in a while, keep people tend to make uh, uh, some confusion uh, referring to alpha synuclein as a pathological uh, protein. Uh, alpha synuclein becomes pathological when uh, it is overexpressed, it's mutated. In other words, when, he, when uh, it uh, starts to aggregate. Otherwise, it's a normal uh, protein that has a series of functions. Uh, probably the most important one is this one, which is interacting with uh, dopaminergic transmission, which also gives you an idea of why synuclein is so important in Parkinson's disease. So basically, what synuclein uh, does uh, regulates the activity of enzymes involved in, uh, in uh, dopamine synthesis like tyrosine hydroxylase, for example, or the uh, aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. And in this case, it shows uh, mostly an inhibitory function. It is involved in uh, the regulation of synaptic vesicle function and dopamine release, as you can see here. And it is also necessary for uh, uh, the trafficking of the uh, dopamine transporter, so basically to the uh, shift from the uh, cytosolic compartment to the, to the membrane, and um, uh, that is important, as you, as you know, for the reuptake of, uh, uh, of dopamine, uh, which is then uh, re, uh, restored within uh, the um, cellular vesicles. So when uh, uh, synuclein uh, is, is pathological, so when it is uh, overexpressed, uh, or it is mutated, all these uh, uh, activities are no longer uh, physiologically uh, regulated. So this gives you an idea of why synuclein interferes uh, or why synuclein can be so important in PD pathogenesis, not just because it is uh, aggregating, so it is basically stuffing uh, uh, cells with uh, uh, abnormal protein levels, but also be because in, in functional terms it is interacting in a negative way with the, the uh, dopamine transmission. So let's go back to our uh, um, uh, scheme. Obviously, I mean, this is a very simplified scheme. This is a scheme that has been very popular in, in the 90s. And uh, as all these schemes has pros and cons, it is nice to have a scheme. It gives you a clear idea of the picture. On the other hand, we obviously have to keep in mind that in nature, nothing can be so simple. But it's helpful because it helps us understand what can uh, go wrong when uh, the Nigra starts to degenerate. So basically, the first thing is that the striatum is deprived of dopaminergic afferents. And uh, uh, to make uh, things a little bit easier, the most important thing is that this nucleus, the subtalabic nucleus, which is the only excitatory nucleus in the circuit, you can see here it's green because green is the color here of, of glutamate, so it is the only glutamatergic uh, excitatory nucleus of the circuit. So STN becomes overactive. It starts uh, um, uh, sending uh, um, overactive uh, projections to the target nuclei, in particular to these two nuclei, which has, uh, we, we have seen before, the output nuclei. So basically what happens is that since these nuclei are inhibitory, red means GABA, the general, the final output of the circuit is reduced because the inhibitory pathway is, is enhanced. So this uh, feedback between the thalamus and uh, the cordate is, uh, is less functioning. And basically, this is what uh, could, uh, of course, give rise to the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. How do we cure this? And uh, this is obviously nothing new. We uh, basically give a substitute for, for dopamine for the deficient neurotransmitter, not directly dopamine. We give a precursor levodopa. Uh, which is still uh, the most used uh, drug in Parkinson's disease, although it has been around for 50, 50 years almost. Right now, but st still, you have to use uh, levodopa in a PD patient. 
Uh, with time, there have been other uh, add-on therapies, also uh, neurosurgical therapies, but uh, uh, nevertheless, levodopa is still the gold standard in, uh, in PD um, therapy. There are two ma basic problems with uh, this therapy. The first one is that this is a just symptomatic therapy, so it does not modify in any way the progression of the disease. Uh, I had a couple of slides of these I removed because I had already too many slides, but uh, it's curious because for a, a, in a certain period, uh, by the end of the, no, the beginning of, of the 90s, some groups also started to, to say that levodopa could be toxic. So, and that was uh, a, a sort of paradox, uh, as you can understand. So thinking of a therapy that on one hand was helping patients uh, relieving their symptoms, on the other hand uh, uh, could um, uh, support the, the, the degeneration uh, underlying the disease, so there was uh, something that, uh, you know, clinicians in particular were, were very worried about. Then it became clear that levodopa can be toxic, but at very high doses, which are the doses that you can use in experimental setting and in vitro or in vivo in animal studies, but uh, at doses that uh, are very hard, very difficult, almost impossible to reach in, uh, in patients. So levodopa is symptomatic. Uh, does not modify the uh, progression of the disease, and uh, uh, it also has a, a, a number of uh, side effects which become manifest uh, after a, a few years of treatment, uh, reduced efficiency, the onset of motor fluctuation, so the patient uh, uh, is in an alternative, um, um, can I say, state of uh, responding or not responding to, to the dose, and uh, most of all, the onset of involuntary movements called dyskinesias, which also accompanies uh, the long-term treatment with uh, uh, levodopa. So all these things together makes us understand why it is so important to find new uh, therapies of Parkinson's disease, which so far, I mean, is the, uh, the main field of, uh, of interest for, I would say, all the people working uh, in, uh, in Parkinson's disease research. Another very important uh, 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 discovery, which was made, or hypothesis actually, which was made uh, in uh, 2003 by this group, um, uh, basically by Eiko Brack, who's a German neuropathologist, was that Louis bodies, which once were thought to be just localized within the uh, substantia nigra, actually they are not restricted to the nigrocedal system, but they can be detected throughout the brain with a, a strange progression, a sort of a, a, an ascending progression, which starts in the lower parts of the brainstem. And this uh, uh, begins, according to Brack, uh, uh, even in preclinical stages of the disease. So when the motor symptoms uh, are not yet present, uh, Lewy bodies uh, uh, could be al already present in the lower parts of the brainstem. Then Lewy bodies starts to, uh, to diffuse, to colonize the rest of the brain with this ascending uh, progression. They move up to the, uh, to the brainstem actually they uh, colonize the, the midbrain here where the uh, substantia nigra is located in, uh, in a sort of uh, middle stage of the disease and then they go up and in the end you can find them also in the cortex. So again, uh, this uh, uh, confirmed that Parkinson's disease is a complex disease in which the dopaminergic defect which comes from the degeneration of the, of the nigra, which is here, uh, and which is related to the motor symptoms of uh, onset is just the tip of the iceberg. And you can understand even, even better this concept if you think that uh, Lewy bodies uh, have also been found outside the brain, for example, in the gut of Parkinsonian patients. And this is a, a finding the, uh, uh, demonstrated uh, the first time by, 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 by Brack, but also confirmed. So again, PD is a complex disease, and according to um, some, uh, some groups, uh, it could also be seen as a systemic disease. Think again of, of all the non motor symptoms. So it is, it is a complicated disease. You can see here, this is a nice picture that gives you an idea of how uh, the symptoms of, uh, of PD evolve across time, you have uh, a preclinical uh, uh, phase, 
which in a way could correspond to the uh, first two stages of the uh, BRAC uh, progression. Then the, the disease starts. It starts unilaterally, so it uh, hits um, uh, just uh, one part of the body. Then it spreads to the contralateral side of the body. And then the progression uh, uh, goes on and on. Uh, you have the motor complications and these kinesias, which are mostly related to the uh, drug therapy, as we, we, we just saw. Then instability and faults. And then we have the onset of uh, um, cognitive and psychiatric symptoms, which could be related to the spread, spreading of uh, those lowy bodies also to the, to the cortex. So it is a complicated disease. Is it a systemic disease? We don't know yet, but there are some systemic components. Uh, and that it's, it is a disease that keeps going and on and basically never stops, no matter what we do, at least so far, with the knowledge that we have right now. So this is why this is so important, understanding, and I'm coming to the third chapter of, of the story, which is the longest one. Why is it so important to know more about the, the pathogenesis of, uh, of Parkinson's disease? So, uh, PD pathogenesis. We don't have one single uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, there are possibly uh, multiple uh, uh, mechanisms interacting uh, uh, with each other. Here, I'm, I'm giving you an idea of uh, the possibly the three uh, most important mechanism that are um, definitely involved in the pathogenesis of Parkinson, which are mitochondrial defects, oxidative distress, and uh, protein aggregation defects, or uh, uh, you can also call it uh, protein um, uh, mis uh, mishandling or uh, proteolytic stress. These are all uh, synonymous. Which superimpose over a background where genetic uh, uh, factors and environmental factors also play a very important uh, role. All these uh, um, mechanisms are uh, strictly interconnected with each other, and uh, uh, you, you will see that in a, uh, in a few moments, but it's also quite natural thinking that mitochondrial defects can lead to, the, uh, to oxidative stress, and that oxidative stress is also influencing uh, the ability of the cells to dispose uh, uh, properly of, uh, of proteins. So basically, uh, when uh, all these mechanisms interact with each other, we end up with uh, cell death in the uh, substantia nigra pars compacta with an additional mechanism that I put here, and I put it here because we, are, uh, we don't know exactly where else to put it right now. It could be uh, just part of this uh, um, bigger picture, or maybe this is the right place. We don't know yet, but we know definitely that inflammation is another uh, element that uh, uh, is involved in this uh, sort of, uh, of cascade. So I would like to give you uh, a couple of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of pictures and, and data regarding uh, every, each and one of these, uh, of these mechanisms, starting with mitochondrial defects. So mitochondrial defects. Uh, Nothing new, at least uh, uh, for the past um, 20 years. It was demonstrated uh, by the end of the 80s, early, early 90s, that patients with Parkinson's disease have a reduced effi um, efficiency of complex one, which is the first um, component of the electron transport chain. And this was demonstrated in the substantia nigra of this patient. It was also reproduced, this data, in uh, peripheral blood uh, uh, cells, for example, in platelets. Uh, uh, or lymphocytes of these patients, although in that case the reduction was uh, uh, less marked. But the, um, the reason why someone at a certain point started to study uh, complex one is, uh, you can see it here in this, in this picture, as you may know, uh, at the end of the 80s, um, there were uh, uh, a number of, um, of uh, PD cases in the in, in US, I think it, that was in, in California, in, uh, in young subjects. So there was a cluster of, uh, of, of, of PD patients. They were all young, and uh, at that time, uh, and, um, we, don't, we, we didn't know anything about uh, the genetics of Parkinson's disease, so we didn't know that there were uh, gene mutations responsible for juvenile Parkinson's disease. So there were these uh, uh, patients coming to the observation of, uh, of clinicians, and in a, in, in a 
a little time, it became uh, obvious that all these uh, uh, subjects had, uh, uh, had been using uh, a, um, a drug of abuse, a, a sort of uh, um, um, chemical heroin, which in fact, which had been synthesized by po po probably by a poor chemist, uh, which in fact was uh, uh, synthesizing not this, uh, this drug that the, these um, uh, young guys were looking for, but it was synthesizing uh, this toxin, MPTP. So then it was uh, demonstrated that MPTP, which is a very uh, lipophilic substance, uh, crosses very easily the blood-brain barrier, and uh, once in the, uh, it is in the brain, it is uh, converted by monoamine oxidase uh, B into MPP plus, which is the real toxin. So MPTP is actually inactive. It has to be converted into MPP plus. Then MPP plus is uh, actively transported, uh, exploiting the, the DAT, so the dopamine transport uh, system, into the uh, nagel neurons. So it is concentrated uh, selectively into the dopamine neurons of the uh, substantia nagra. Once in the neurons, it goes uh, to the mitochondria, and within the mitochondria, MPP plus blocks complex one. So this is why, at a certain point, someone uh, thought of uh, um, starting to study complex one in, uh, in patients. Uh, with time, the concept of mitochondrial involve involvement in, uh, in PD has further uh, evolved. And um, it has evolved because it became clear that mitochondria are not static organelles. Instead, they are dynamic organelles. So they, they, they fuse with each other, or they divide. So they undergo these processes called fusion and, and fission. And basically, the, um, uh, they do this in order to provide energy throughout uh, the extended neuronal process, which means that, as you know, neurons have a cell body, have the axons, but the uh, terminals can be far away from the cell body. So neurons are cells which uh, have high energy demand. So we need to, uh, well, cells need energy uh, throughout the, 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 the whole extension. Uh, so from the cell body to the terminals. And so mitochondria need to be dynamic uh, organelles because only in this way they can provide energy. For example, at the presynaptic terminals where you have to release uh, the transmitter into the synaptic cleft, uh, vesicle have to fuse uh, with the membrane. So all these processes uh, require energy and in this way uh, mitochondria can, can uh, provide energy uh, throughout the cell. If we have uh, fission or fusion defects, uh, these defects limit the mitochondrial uh, motility, so the energy uh, produced by, uh, by the mitochondria is decreased. There is, of course, uh, uh, increased oxidative stress. Mitochondrial DNA can be damaged. Calcium buffering, which is also another very important function uh, of uh, mitochondria, can be uh, also impaired. So all these conditions can lead to neuronal death. So basically, uh, Mitochondrial dynamics uh, uh, represent another uh, major mechanism within the mitochondria chapter which can play a role in, uh, in PD pathogenesis. And why just in PD pathogenesis? So why mm, uh, mostly in, uh, in dopaminergic neurons? Because dopamine itself can interfere with, with mitochondrial efficiency. Uh, it has been shown, for example, the, that mitochondrial density and mass are lower in the substantia nagra plus compacta uh, neurons, and then we know, we just briefly mentioned this, that dopamine is a very powerful uh, uh, prooxidant, so it undergoes auto oxidation and also enzymatic, enzymatic oxidation, and these also lead to impaired mitochondrial respiration and membrane and permeability. And also dopamine can modify uh, the function of several chaperons, which are proteins that play a very important role in the quality control of, uh, of, uh, of mitochondria. So this is why uh, mitochondria can play a role, it can be directly uh, impaired, particularly in uh, dopamine-containing neurons. Uh, very important uh, uh, information uh, regarding the specific uh, topic have been derived from the study of uh, familial PD. And this is because virtually all proteins 
that are involved in genetic uh, mm, uh, PD, and most of these proteins are kinases, are associated with mitochondria. LARC2, for example, which uh, is, uh, is uh, mutated in the PARC8, which is a, a more uh, frequent dominant form of genetic uh, uh, PD, and synuclein have been found associated with the mitochondria, other, other membrane. DJ1, uh, it is a cytosolic uh, protein uh, which, uh, under condition of oxidative stress, can translocate to the mitochondria, um, serving as an uh, an antioxidant uh, um, element. Pink1, which is another kinase, uh, can be localized uh, both to cytoplasm and mitochondria, and PARKIN, which is mutated in uh, PARK2, which is the more frequent uh, recessive form of genetic PD, is cytosolic, but uh, can translocate to the mitochondria and after phosphorylation by PINK1. And this, uh, um, this couple, these two proteins, PINK1 and PARK1 in particular, are very important because this uh, PINK1 uh, parking pathway, it is probably one of the most important regulators of mitochondrial uh, morphology by promoting uh, mitochondrial fission. So uh, in any condition in which uh, we have uh, a um, deficient function of these two proteins, as we have, for example, in these two forms of uh, genetic PD, we have a reduced efficiency of this uh, mechanism, so we have a reduced efficiency of the mitochondrial uh, quality control. Oxidative stress, well, after all we have said about the mitochondrial impairment, oxidative stress comes al al almost natural as an uh, additional uh, mechanism uh, in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's PD, of uh, <laughs> Parkinson's uh, disease. So again, uh, the nigra compacta is probably um, within the brain the area most exposed to oxidative stress that depends on the these high rates of formation of uh, free radicals, which is linked to the high levels of, pod, uh, of dopamine, which uh, undergoes ad oxidation, as we've seen, but also iron. Uh, the nigra is just uh, uh, filled with, uh, with iron, and the presence of iron accelerates by phantom reaction uh, the formation of uh, reactive oxygen uh, species. Of course, uh, uh, we, we've just seen this, uh, uh, this formation of uh, um, free radicals uh, is associated of, with the mitochondrial uh, function impairment. And all the major uh, PD-inducing toxins like uh, MPTP, MPP+, the one that we, that we have just seen, but also rhodenone and 6-hydroxydopamine, uh, they all cause massive uh, oxidative damage within the nigrocellular tract. And finally, there are um, several post-mortem studies uh, which have shown uh, increased uh, ox uh, levels of, of uh, oxidized uh, proteins, uh, lipids uh, of oxidative damage to the DNA, so in the brains of Parkinsonian uh, patients. So protein aggregation, the third mechanism, uh, which is one, probably the, uh, I wouldn't say the, the most interesting, but it's certainly the one that is currently um, become uh, the focus of, uh, of most attention in, uh, in this field. So again, we go back to synuclein. Synuclein and the wee bodies, uh, we just said synuclein, the queen of, of, of PD. So we know that in, in Parkinson's disease, uh, synuclein uh, starts to aggregate, goes uh, through these uh, uh, sequential steps of aggregation, but the problem is why, at a certain point, uh, uh, synuclein start to, to aggregate. There could be uh, a number of reasons. I, I've tried to, uh, to simplify all these uh, uh, possible reasons, uh, uh, splitting them into three specific conditions that might affect the uh, solubility of uh, synuclein. So we might have genetic... Uh, um, uh, genetic reasons, post-translational modifications, and also uh, quantitative defects. So in other words, uh, defects in the uh, activity of the degradation pathways of the, of the cell, particularly the ubiquitin program system and the autophagy mechanism, which could um, uh, uh, cause a reduced removal of uh, synergy.
proline and then triggering accumulation uh, of, uh, of this protein. So let's start with the first one, gene mutation. So uh, I just said that mutation in sinuglein was the first mutation recognized in the field of uh, familial uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, there are a couple of, uh, of mutations uh, that have been uh, uh, recognized. All these mutations basically change the solubility of this protein. So mutated uh, mutant sinuglein tend to form fibrils um, far more rapidly than uh, wild-type sinuglein. There is also uh, the, another form of, of a familial PD in which sinuclein is not mutated, but just overabundant, and this is, linked, this is due to a duplication of triplication in the sinuclein gene. So in this case, we don't have uh, mut uh, mutated sinuclein. We have just too much sinuclein. And this is also another reason to induce uh, uh, intracellular precipitation. So the cell is, now, is not able to, to deal with uh, all that much sinuclein that keeps uh, forming uh, uh, inside. Another possible region, uh, reason uh, for uh, synuclein aggregation, and we here at, at the post-translational level, you can see here it's a number of, uh, of post-translational modifications, uh, phosphorylation, nitration, oxidation, which can uh, uh, modify uh, the structure, the alpha helix um, structure of synuclein, uh, so favoring the aggregation of, of synuclein. Phosphorylation, for example, is very important because uh, the synuclein that you find in, uh, in lobby bodies is typically uh, phosphorylated uh, on these uh, residues in uh, 129. So this is typical of the synuclein that uh, a pathologist will find in, uh, in the lobby body. On the other hand, we just um, talked about oxidation which plays such an important role in PD, so you can understand now very easily how oxidation can be linked to the mitochondrial defect, but also to uh, proteidic stress. Nitration also, because nitric oxide, which is a gaseous uh, uh, neurotransmitter, which also plays a role in neurodegeneration, mostly because it's linked, and we will see that, uh, I think, in a slide uh, later on, Nitric oxide is, uh, is released in massive amounts by uh, activated microglia. So in uh, all the neuroinflammatory conditions where microglia is activated, microglia starts to release a lot, uh, to synthesize a lot of nitric oxide. So nitric oxide, over exceeding quantities of nitric oxide, nitric oxide can modify synuclein structure by nitrating uh, tyrosine residues, which promotes the formation of, uh, of oli oligomers of synuclein, this has been shown um, uh, in various conditions. In uh, PD patients, uh, you see that uh, uh, nitrated uh, alpha synuclein uh, selectively accumulates in, uh, in Lewy body, uh, but also in animal models of, of um, animals, for example, intoxicated with MPTP, in this case, you will have a massive formation of three nitrotyrosine uh, in the substantia nigra of these animals. The third mechanism that I was mentioning uh, to you is the defects in uh, degradation pathway. So in this case, we don't have uh, mutations affecting uh, um, the protein. We don't have post-translational uh, modification. We just have some defects in, the, in those mechanisms that, um, that, that are there to deal, uh, to dispose of, of, um, of proteins in the cell. This is one, uh, probably the most important, the ubiquitin protosome system. And basically, this is a sort of, uh, of uh, uh, protein grinder. So the re the, 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 what this thing does is basically uh, recognizing uh, um, proteins that have to be disposed of uh, abnormal proteins, uh, damaged, uh, oxidized proteins, uh, nitrated proteins, all just proteins uh, that, that are in excess that, that has to be uh, removed or uh, transported back into peptides. So basically, uh, the cell recognizes these proteins by tagging these proteins with ubiquitin tails. Once the protein has these ubiquitin tails uh, attached, uh, it can be recognized by this uh, sort of uh, trash bin uh, for proteins, which is the UPS. The protein comes, uh, uh, enters this, uh, this, uh, this bin, and it is then uh, degraded and then ubiquitin uh, is, uh, is released and made uh, 
um, available for another cycle of, um, of protein degradation. This system apparently does not work very well in Parkinsonian patients. Uh, there are uh, defects, uh, for example, both in the levels and activity of uh, the catalytic subunit of the protosome, which is the 20S uh, um, subunit, which is reduced uh, by 40, 50 percent in the substantial nagra of Parkinsonian patients. Uh, we have seen that this reduction uh, is also uh, recognizable in uh, peripheral blood uh, cells, for example, in, uh, in lymphocytes of Parkinsonian patients, but not in Alzheimer's patients. So it seems as this uh, um, defect could be just specific for, for Parkinson's disease. And uh, it also seems that this defect might be generalized and this um, uh, take us back to the, one of the first concepts that I showed you this morning, which is that Parkinson's disease could be actually a systemic disease in which uh, uh, these, uh, these modifications could be um, um, possibly detectable or, or, or present anywhere in the body, but only in, the, in those areas of the brain, the substantial nagra, they combine with each other, or maybe with other elements, environmental uh, components, for example, giving rise to the uh, neurodegenerative process. But if the, these uh, um, defects are, in fact, generalized, we should be able to, to see them basically anywhere. And for example, right now, we don't, I don't have this uh, uh, data uh, with me. And actually, I'm not showing much of our data. I wanted to, to give you just a general uh, view of the, of the whole uh, chapter. But we are extending this uh, evaluation uh, on um, fibroblasts of, of Parkinsonian patients, uh, isolated um, culture from uh, skin biopsies, uh, for example. And we are uh, studying, we are trying to replicate this finding, uh, first of all, and then we are uh, examining the, the efficiency of the autophagic system. The first thing that we saw is that also the fibroblasts of these patients show a reduced activity of the protonosome 20S at a degree which is similar to the degree that we observed in, uh, in the lymphocytes. And then, of course, in, uh, in animals, but anything works in, in animals. I mean, all the experiments that you will do in, in animals, uh, unless you do something really wrong, they, they work all, almost, uh, almost always. The problem is that when you try to translate your, your result, your preclinical result, to the clinical uh, um, field, and then things change. But anyway, in, in animals, uh, if you infused uh, protosome inhibitors, they are many available also commercially into the nigrocellular tract of rats, you cause neurodegeneration and formation of cytoplasmic inclusions, which are positive for alpha synuclein and ubiquitin, so which are uh, like they, they like to, to call them uh, Lewy body-like inclusions. The other defective mechanism uh, um, that I mentioned uh, before, which uh, could influence uh, the, just the amount of synuclein within the cell is, is, is autophagy, which is another thing that right now is very, um, uh, very fashionable. You have to study autophagy if you want to be a, a really cool uh, scientist. So everybody is studying uh, autophagy. But, I mean, joking aside, uh, there have been um, um, uh, a large number of, of reports showing that autophagy and autophagic pathways, because as you know, there are more than one uh, autophagic pathways can be um, involved in a PD pathogenesis. And uh, in this sense, uh, it is interesting to consider that alpha synuclein, uh, as you can see here in this nice uh, uh, review published very, very recently, could be at the same, uh, at the same time both cause and consequent consequence of autophagic dysfunction, be, be, because if you see here, synuclein, Accumulation of, of intracellular synuclein could be a direct uh, um, consequence of a defect of dysfunction in macroautophagy. Once it's established, al alpha synuclein uh, increase could um, lead to dysfunction of uh, CMA, which tends to for chaperone mediated autophagy, which is another type of, 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 uh, of autophagy. This dysfunction leads to lysosomal dysfunction, and so basically impairs. Uh, cell function leading to uh, neuronal death. So alpha synuclein once again stands in a very crucial uh, crossroad of the PV pathogenic uh, mechanism. 
Not just that, because uh, autophagy uh, serves as a uh, main mechanism to eliminate um, damaged uh, proteins or proteins in excess, but it also um, eliminates uh, organelles, for example, organelles that are no longer functioning uh, in a proper way. Mitochondria, first of all, once mitochondria are no longer working uh, uh, well, so when the, they become depolarized, they have to be eliminated, and they are eliminated uh, by autophagic mechanisms. And in this case, again, uh, a couple of those proteins that I showed you before, PINK1 and PARKIN, uh, intervene uh, with very important um, uh, functions. PINK1, for example, which is uh, um, uh, associated with the, with the mitochondria, basically recruits PARKIN. PARKIN is a ubiquitin ligase, so PARKIN um, ubiquitin A, a couple of, of proteins which then basically serve as recognition triggers for the autos uh, autophagic uh, vesicle. So in this way, if this system works um, well, the damaged or um, uh, expired, we could call it expired mitochondria, can be um, eliminated by the autophagic system. If these do not work uh, well, we have um, a defect in mitophagy, which, of course, is another reason for uh, damaging the whole mitochondrial uh, function, because mitophagy, as you can see here, is crucial for the mitochondrial quality control. Uh, it is interesting to, uh, to know that Although uh, there have been uh, hundreds of studies uh, on, on Lewy body, so on these uh, typical uh, cytoplasmic inclusions that we find in PD patients, we still are not sure whether Lewy bodies are bad or, or, or good for the cell. So in other words, whether they are protectors or, or perpetrators, um, there are some groups who, who say that uh, um, Lewy bodies, of course, are, are damaging the cells because they are basically intoxicating, suffocating the cells. Other groups, they say that this uh, ability of the cells to um, uh, recognize these proteins and uh, to isolate them into these uh, uh, inclusions could be a sort of protective mechanism, at least in the first stages of the disease. And this is something very important to, think in, to keep in mind because there are, speaking of inno in innovative therapies, there are also some uh, uh, immune-related um, uh, therapeutic um, attempts in which, for example, uh, some groups are st uh, trying to um, use uh, anti-synuclein uh, antibodies just to prevent the formation of Lewy bodies. So you understand how important that is. If Lewy bodies are just damaging the cells, so it's important even to um, prevent the cells from the formation of these Lewy bodies. On the other hand, if Lewy bodies are protective, you are just depriving the cells of a, at least an initial form of, of cellular protection. So it is extremely important to, to resolve this, uh, this issue. So um, uh, I like this, this, the face of this guy uh, because I, I thought that he could uh, introduce quite well the next couple of slides uh, that I'm going to show you. Uh, a surprising discovery, and we are still in the field of Lewy bodies. It was really surprising uh, because, uh, so we have to make one step back. One step back. Uh, in the mid-90s, uh, there were uh, some attempts uh, to uh, cure Parkinsonian patients by transplanting fetal tissue. So by transplanting uh, cells uh, which were already differentiated toward uh, a neuronal type able to release dopamine, so non stem cells. They were uh, embryonic or fetal uh, dopaminergic neurons. Uh, the results were mm, moderate, uh, not exciting. Uh, the first studies were open label studies. Then the NHA sponsored a couple double blind placebo control studies. And in, uh, in these um, control studies, basically, uh, the, the researchers saw so no differences between uh, uh, grafted and sham operated patients. Additional problems also were noted, for example, the um, uh, very important occurrence of dyskinesia in these patients. So anyway, basically, this whole field of studies uh, w uh, was um, basically abandoned because of this uh, uh, mode of complication. But the important thing is that uh, some 
10 to 15 years later, uh, in the meantime, some of these patients had uh, a disease. So uh, the same group who had uh, done this, uh, this transplantation examined the brains of these patients, and they uh, found this very um, uh, surprising feature, which is why I put, so this is, I think this is the right expression to make, because they saw that uh, uh, even uh, the neurons uh, that had been transplanted, so the, uh, the healthy neurons, uh, show the presence of alpha synuclein positive uh, Lewy bodies. So it, it is as if also the, the, um, the healthy neurons had become sick with Parkinson's disease after, after a while. And that, of course, was... Uh, um, really disconcerting for the uh, scientific community, but also it was uh, a great um, input, uh, a great stimulus to, to, um, to go uh, m more deeply into the synuclein uh, dynamics. So almost immediately there was a group showing that alpha synuclein can be transmitted via endocytosis uh, from uh, one cell to, to another, provided that these cells have neighboring, so they, they stay uh, next to, to each other thereby producing Levy body inclusions. And this led to um, a couple of really uh, big groups to propose that synucleopathies, or uh, PD in general, could be uh, a sort of primal-like disorders. Of course, this is a theory. Uh, Nobody, I think, really believed that uh, Parkinson's disease is a prion, prion disorder, but the prion-like uh, mode of transmission is really uh, fascinating. So it is something that might really help under, un understand how and why synuclein is actually uh, um, transmitting uh, from one cell to, to another. So basically, uh, there have been uh, this uh, hypothesis that um, synuclein could be uh, transmitted like the prion protein does, uh, exploding, uh, for example, exosomes or tunneling nanotubes, so two different uh, uh, types of, of transmission uh, by which uh, the inclusions can be transmitted from one cell uh, to the other. And uh, this, uh, this hypothesis also, um, in a way, gave more uh, retrospective um, uh, um, credit, again, to Heiko Brack, because Heiko Brack, uh, in 2007, so before this, uh, this observation uh, of the transmission of, uh, of Louis Baris uh, had been uh, revealed, had hypothesized a very strange thing. So uh, if you remember, I told you that Louis Baris can also be found in the, in the intestine of Parkinsonian patients. So Heiko Brack uh, uh, developed this dual uh, heat hypothesis in which the first heat could be actually in the brain, but the other heat could be in the periphery, maybe at the, uh, at the gut level, where some uh, um, damaging neurotropic agent could be um, taken up by the intestinal mucosa and then uh, going backwards because, as you know, most of the intestine is innervated by the, um, um, uh, by the motor dorsal nucleus of the vagus, right? And actually, this nucleus in the BRAC progression is the first nucleus that can be involved in Parkinson's disease. So what BRAC hypothesizes is that if there is a, any agent like this, which can be, uh, let's say, absorbed by the mucosa, incorporated in the neurons, then it could, back, uh, it could uh, travel back along the vagal nerve, going all the way up to the, morsel, uh, to the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, which is in the lower part of the brainstem, and from that point it could start spreading uh, in that uh, um, bottom-up uh, sort of, uh, of, uh, of transmission. I'm not asking you, of course, to believe this. I'm just asking that this is a hypothesis which look absolutely crazy when it was postulated, but after this uh, uh, the demonstration that asphalt synuclein can act like that, so that can actually be transmitted by a cell to the other, uh, it became a little bit more um, acceptable. 
The other thing that has become quite uh, obvious right now is that uh, the most toxic, the most uh, damaging uh, uh, stage uh, of sinu in the synuclein uh, um, um, cascade, it is not when synuclein is already aggregated within the, the, the Levy body, but it, it's, uh, it is uh, in one of the uh, earliest stages of this uh, process, uh, which is the soluble oligomer uh, stage. So alpha synuclein, oligomeric alpha synuclein, is actually the most toxic form of synuclein which is the same thing that has become clear, for example, for beta amyloid in Alzheimer's disease. Also in that case, amyloid uh, oligomers are the most toxic uh, forms, are the, f the, the, the forms responsible for synaptic toxicity, for example. Once amyloid is uh, organized in the amyloid plaque, is no longer toxic for, for neurons. Same things happen probably also in Parkinson's disease. So also in this case, uh, it is the oligomeric synuclein which is responsible for the neuronal uh, toxicity. And why uh, is that so? For example, because synuclein in the oligomeric form is able to basically punch some holes in the, in the, in the cell membranes. So it's directly damaging the, the cell membrane, which also makes sense because it could be a way to, to, um, to help the transmission of the, of the inclusion from, from one cell to another, just making holes in the, in the membranes. Uh, this is, for example, a, a nice study, very recent study, in which basically this group used um, uh, different uh, transgenic forms, uh, uh, transgenic animals, so animals carrying different mutations of alpha synuclein, mutation responsible for the formation of the fibrillary form of alpha synuclein, which is, let, let's say, the non-toxic form, or mutations like these two, which uh, prompts animal to form uh, oligomeric alpha synuclein. And when they try uh, to correlate the formation of, of oligomers, trimers, for example, with the, with the cell loss, with the dopaminergic cell loss, TH stands for tyrosine hydroxylase, which is a typical marker used to identify dopamine uh, cells, they saw very clearly that these two mutations, uh, which are the mutations that um, um, forced the animal to form oligomeric uh, synuclein, were the mutations in which you had, they had, the highest uh, uh, degree of cell loss, of dopaminergic cell loss. So thereby confirming that oligomers of synuclein are far more toxic than, than uh, um, fibrillary uh, forms of, of synuclein. And uh, this is a nice example, uh, on the other hand, of how some groups try to translate this very recent information to the clinical side. So in this study, uh, this group uh, tried to measure uh, synuclein, both total and oligomeric synuclein, the cerebrospinal fluid of Parkinsonian patients, because uh, another very important field of research in Parkinson's disease is the search for biomarkers, uh, which could be helpful for a number of reasons. They could be helpful for uh, identifying a, a trait of disease, for which means basically the susceptibility to the disease, or the probability that one person at a certain point in his life develops Parkinson's disease and the other one uh, uh, doesn't. Or a follow-up uh, markers, uh, which could be useful, uh, if, for example, to follow uh, in time the effect of a certain drug that is supposed to, to act on a certain uh, biochemical pathway. If you, do, if you don't have a biochemical uh, 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 biomarker, uh, you cannot follow, for example, the, the effect of this drug. Uh, so they measured the synuclein uh, in the CSF of uh, Parkinsonian patients in patients with other uh, neuro uh, neurological diseases and in normal uh, controls. And they found basically no differences when they measure just total synuclein. When they measure uh, instead uh, the uh, oligomeric forms of synuclein, they found that Parkinsonian patients had, uh, had higher levels of uh, CSF uh, uh, oligomers compared both to other neurological uh, patients or normal controls. When they did the oligomers to total uh, synuclein ratio, this difference became even more uh, apparent. So they concluded that levels of synuclein oligomers in the CSF, and in particular this ratio between uh, oligomers and the total synuclein, could be really useful markers for diagnosis and early detection of Parkinson's disease because early detection is another very important issue in Parkinson's disease. If you uh, think that 
like I said, a, a Parkinsonian patients when start developing, when start manifesting um, symptoms, st has already lost 80% of, uh, of, of, of the neurons, which means that it has a 20 or 30% of neurons left. But a, a patient in uh, at first diagnosis is still uh, an active person. It is, they still can conduct a, a almost uh, normal life, which means that that 20 30 percent of remaining cells are still uh, enough for um, for conducting a, a good life. So, if it is possible, if I mean, if we had the possibility of diagnosing very early uh, the um, the disease, even without preventing the disease, but just stopping disease progression at that stage, even, uh, you know, maintaining that 20% of cells could be just enough uh, for a patient to uh, still conducting a, uh, an active life with a, with a, with a, with a good, good um, quality of life. Genetics. Un'ora e mezza, giusto, Marco? Genetics, I will go very, very uh, quickly because I already introduced this, and this is just, I mean, we will need just a week to, 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 to explain everything about uh, PD genetics, so I'm just uh, mentioning again, uh, for historical reason, this, which is the, the first mutation uh, demonstrated in, in, uh, in, uh, in PD families, uh, which, which um, uh, hits the synuclein gene, uh, demonstrated in 1907, and then other uh, mutations that have been demonstrated in, uh, in these familial forms of Parkinson's disease. These par PARC2, uh, in, in PARC2, the protein mutated is Parkin, and at this point we know very well Parkin and we know everything about Parkin, right? And PARC2 is the, the most uh, frequently uh, recognized form of uh, autosomal recessive uh, Parkinson's disease. While PARC8, and in PARC8 we, we have uh, LARC2, um, which is a, 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 another kinase, PARC8 is the most common uh, form of, of dominant um, uh, Parkinson's disease. I'm just uh, showing, showing you a few interesting uh, uh, aspects of this genetic um, uh, evolution of the Parkinson story because uh, it has become it's becoming clear that uh, genetics uh, is going to, to have a, a more and more important role in, uh, in PD pathogenesis. Probably not only in, uh, in, in genetic PD, but maybe also in sporadic PD. As you can see here, LARC2, um, which is, uh, um, uh, like, like we said, the most uh, frequent form of, uh, of dominant uh, genetic PD, it is uh, present in 5 to 13 percent of all familial forms of PD, but it's also present in 1 to 5 percent of sporadic uh, Parkinsonian patients, which is quite a lot. And then there are some strange clusters of, of, uh, of this mutation. This is the, the most frequent one, which seems to have a predilection for some ethnic uh, um, uh, communities, in particular for uh, um, the uh, Arabic um, population of North Africa or uh, for the Ashkenazi Jews in these um, ethnic uh, groups, the, the percentage of the mutation, both for the sporadic and for the genetic forms, uh, goes really to uh, um, amazing uh, percentages. Another, uh, and this is also another uh, interesting uh, finding still regarding the LARC2 uh, mutation, so in this case, uh, uh, this group studied uh, first, degree, first degree relative of patients with Parkinson's disease. And some of these relatives uh, had a mutation in LAC2, but they did not have any, any PD symptoms. The other half of these uh, relatives, they, they were known carriers. So they um, studied with sort of complicated um, uh, tools, uh, basically, uh, gate alterations, uh, gate of, of course, as you know, gate alterations in, in one of the main uh, features uh, of Parkinson's disease. So basically what they found is that uh, uh, gate alterations, subtle uh, alterations, but still uh, clearly uh, detectable, were observable in, uh, in relatives of PD patients who were carrying the mutations
think that this uh, of mutant lag two could actually um, uh, represent a sort of a premodular presymptomatic uh, um, uh, condition that may actually increase the risk of developing Parkinson's disease later in life. I don't know whether this is clear. Hmm? Ah, <laughs> l'andatura, il, uh, il cammino. We thank Professor Bono for his uh, <laughs> helpful uh, intervention. And um, uh, another thing that it has been recognized uh, very recently, it, which is also very, uh, very important, is that uh, uh, there are some genome-wide association studies which have been performed in, in large, large cohorts of sporadic, this time, sporadic PD patients, uh, evaluating, for example, the, um, the frequency of, of common variants, uh, so basically of, uh, of SNPs, so single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms. And uh, all these studies have confirmed the presence of, uh, of SNPs in sporadic uh, patients affecting mostly, again, the synuclein uh, gene and MAPPT, it's, uh, we, we, we better call it tau, which is a very important protein, as you know, in Alzheimer's disease. So these SNPs in these two genes have been uh, consistently reported in sporadic PD patients. So these uh, 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 common variants may actually enhance the risk of, uh, of, of, of developed Parkinson's disease in sporadic PD patients, which is why I just told you that it is likely that genetic uh, uh, is going to, to play a, a more and more a strong role uh, in, uh, in Parkinson's disease uh, in the next future. Environment. Uh, I'm realizing that I put too many slides in this presentation. But so environment is the other uh, element that we stood in the background of that, uh, that picture uh, on the PD uh, pathogenic mechanism. Environment, why? Uh, this is another huge, really huge chapter. Environment, why? Because nigrocidal pathway is a preferential target for a number of uh, en environmental toxins. And there are really hundreds of, of paper on, uh, papers on this. Again, everything started with the MPTP story. Um, we already sh uh, saw this, uh, this slide. Why with the MPTP? Be because it, 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 was, uh, it became clear that MPTP, and particularly MPP+, which is the real toxin, shared almost the same chemical structure with a class of compounds of pesticides, in particular with paraquat. So at that point, uh, lots of groups started to, to explore this correlation between nigrocidal damage and, uh, and mitochondria. It, it, it became clear very, very soon that uh, pesticides have a, a clear and, and specific toxicity to um, nigral neurons, and in particular to the mitochondria or, or nigral neurons, because uh, Basically, all pesticides that have been uh, studied so far, paraquat, rodenone, uh, uh, maneb, uh, dieldrin, uh, um, they all affect the efficiency of the, um, um, of, of the mitochondrial electrotransport chain. Paraquat is also acting, acting as a redox uh, compound, so it can also, um, uh, it can both affect the mitochondria, but it can also uh, act as a pro-oxidant uh, uh, per se. So again, pesticides affecting the mitochondria of nigral neurons, uh, nigral neurons which are already under a lot of oxidative stress because of dopamine, that could be another reason why these uh, compounds uh, um, affect specifically th this part of the brain. And of course, there have been a lot of epidemiological studies uh, showing that uh, uh, people who are exposed to, for, for, uh, for, for professional reasons, people working, for example, in the agricultural uh, field, who are exposed uh, permanently to, to, pe to pesticide, have uh, um, an increased risk of, of developing uh, Parkinson's disease. And finally, inflammation. Inflammation, uh, this is a, a quite recent uh, um, chapter in, uh, in, in, in this story, but it is a very important one. This is an important one because there, there are uh, numerous findings supporting the, the role of, of neuroinflammation in Parkinson's disease, 
in both patients and, uh, and in animal models of the disease. In patients, for example, because there are uh, reports uh, uh, showing increased level of cytokines in the uh, CSF or, or striatum of, uh, of PD brains, in addition to increased number of oxidative microglia, uh, increased activity of microglia in some of those patients who had been exposed to MPTP. And, and also, uh, interesting epidemiological uh, evidence, uh, and this is shared also by Alzheimer's disease, showing that uh, uh, in um, subjects who take uh, anti-inflammatory drugs or non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs for, for uh, chronically for a number of reasons, uh, uh, arthritis, for example, in those classes of patients, the risk of developing Parkinson's disease is, uh, is lower. This led, of course, to the, to the investigation of, uh, of uh, anti-inflammatory drugs in Parkinson's disease, but mostly in Alzheimer's disease, obviously nothing worked. This is a nice picture, for example, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of a group of, um, uh, basically of the group of Dave Brooks in, uh, in, uh, in London. They used uh, a PET um, imaging technique which used this uh, uh, tracer which basically identified activated microglia and they showed quite nicely here, this is the, the brain of a normal subject, this is the brain of Parkinsonian subject. You can see the, area, the areas in, uh, in, in yellow are the areas where the tracer is uh, recognizing the activated microglia, which means that, uh, uh, which basically sh uh, tells us uh, that uh, microglia is massively activated in patients. PD patients also have uh, uh, um, infiltration of T lymphocytes, CD8 uh, and CD4 plus uh, T lymphocytes in the, in the Nigra. And this has been shown um, very nicely by the group of, uh, of Brocard and, uh, and uh, Etienne Hirsch. And this is basically the, uh, the numbers correlated to these images showing that uh, both CD8 and uh, CD4 uh, positive populations of lymphocytes are mm, higher numbers, have higher numbers in the substantial Niagara of Parkinsonian patients. Also at the peripheral level, uh, there is another group who showed a significant decrease, which could be in a way understandable if you think that uh, some of these sets could be sequestered at the, at the central level, decreased at the peripheral level of CD plus, uh, CD8, CD4 plus, CD8 plus uh, uh, T-cell ratio, and also a decrease in CD4, CD, 25 in Parkinsonian patients. Or another group who, sh who proposed that natural killer cells are more active or better are more susceptible to activation in these patients. And then of course there is a, a plethora of, of animal studies uh, proving the connection between neuroinflammation and Parkinson's disease. So basically all the uh, toxins used to replicate Parkinson's disease in animals, in addition to provoking oxidative stress, they also trigger neuro, uh, neuronal inflammation. They trigger, again, uh, T lymphocyte infiltration. This is, for example, a study by the same uh, group as before uh, with, uh, in uh, mice treated with MPTP. As you, you can see here, the infiltration of lymphocytes in the Nigra. And uh, again, the role of microglia, which seems to be the, the, the most important one, microglia, I'm not telling you anything about it because you know that uh, because it's, it's very late right now. But microglia is certainly playing a, a very important role in Parkinson's disease to the point that some groups, uh, in particular the group of, uh, by of Etienne Hirsch proposed that microglial activation could be an early phenomenon in the whole process underlying uh, Parkinson's disease. So they made this, this nice uh, uh, scheme. In, in this case, they correlated the progression to a single uh, um, and uh, recognizable uh, toxic uh, insult, which is the MPTP um, uh, administration. And according to their uh, uh, theory, as you can see here, the blue line, the microglial cell activation could represent a really early phenomenon corresponding to the first initial stage in which there is already a neuronal distress, but neuronal death is, no lo is, is not uh, massive yet, 
probably neural that is already uh, ongoing, but possibly is not uh, um, easily recognizable uh, at this level. Then the other uh, immune-related uh, um, phenomena comes in, uh, the T-cell infiltration and the uh, activation of astrocytes. And at that point, we have the neuronal death and we have the formation of the cytoplasmic inclusions. And like I said before, microglial activation is associated with induction of uh, inducible uh, uh, nitric oxide synthase, which means, in other words, that microglia, once it is, it is activated, release a lot of nitric oxide, which is uh, rapidly uh, transformed into um, um, uh, reactive oxygen uh, uh, species, uh, RNS, and these, like we, we, we saw before, could represent an additional mechanism piling up with the other mechanisms that induce oxidative stress uh, leading to neuronal cell death. We saw that this actually could be true also in another model of Parkinson's disease, a simple model but still very used, which is the 6 hydroxy dopamine uh, uh, model, uh, which we've been using for, uh, uh, for, for quite a long time. This is just to show you that uh, mm, when, you go, when, you, when you give 6-hydroxydopamine, uh, 6-hydroxydopamine is, a, is a, a neurotoxin which is specific for, pack, for uh, uh, dominagic neurons. It is taken up by the, um, uh, that transporter. Uh, it, it gives you a, a massive oxidative uh, uh, damage. Uh, but when you inject it in the striatum, the striatum is the place where the dopaminergic terminals are. So you have the terminals and the striatum and the cell body in the Niagara, which is uh, quite far away from, from the striatum. You have an immediate lesion at the striatum. You can see the hole here caused by the toxin. But in the, in the Niagara, where the cell bodies are, one week later, you still have the cell bodies represented there, which, which does not necessarily mean that nothing is happening here. It just means that you don't have still yet a, uh, a clear neuronal loss. Neuronal loss starts later on, after two weeks, and then it keeps going. So we basically uh, try to see how the microglia uh, was behaving in this uh, experimental setting. Uh, we saw, for example, in this triadum, this is a, a typical staining for an antigen which is expressed by the activated microglia. These is an Im image taken in normal shem animals, so non-lesion non animals. Microglia is almost invisible, so it is uh, in the resting uh, state. This is the staining for TH, so this is the staining for dopaminergic terminals. They are there. There is no, no damage, of course, because this is a normal animal. This is one damaged animal. You can see the huge activation here in the microglia, and the TH signal uh, has disappeared, which means that terminals are, are, are damaged, destroyed. And this activation is maintained throughout the whole experimental period, which in this case was, was four weeks. And that was the striatum. In the Niagara, I told you that in the Niagara, the cell loss starts uh, later, let's say two weeks after the striatal insult. So this, is, again, is the normal animals, nothing. This is the lesion animals. You can see that after a week, the, the cell bodies, the dominagic cell bodies, were still... Uh, there and you can't see any uh, real difference between uh, the control and the damaged animals. But, but the microglial activation was already clearly visible. Uh, it went down considerably after two, four weeks, but after four weeks we saw also the neuronal damage in the, in the Niagara Compata. So that, in a way, goes quite well with the idea that microglial activation could be a very early phenomenon, possibly preceding the actual uh, loss of uh, neurons, and nitric oxide, again, could be um, a nice way to link all these, uh, these mechanisms. So the last few um, slides, just to, to show you, I don't know, probably in the audience there is someone working with animal models of Parkinson's disease or with animal models of neurological disease uh, in general. Is there anyone? Excellent. No, I'm, 
I'm not speaking any of any therapeutics, and I'm just giving you, just because I, I didn't want to overlap with other possible uh, presentations. I wanted just to give a, a general idea of all the pathogenic mechanisms that might be involved. And um, so in terms of animal models, the, if, if you study Parkinson's disease, you are quite lucky because Parkinson's disease is one of the few uh, I would say neurological disorders for which we, we do have uh, animal models. Models obviously are not perfect. You have to keep in mind which are the pros and cons of, of any models. Uh, and so using one model or, or, or another just depends on, on, on what you, you, you want to look or, or which is the purpose of, of, your, search, of your research. Uh, but we know, well, that what we, we want from a, a, an animal model is, um, is a replication as close as possible of both the pathological features of the disease and also of the model symptoms of the disease. So for this, we have both toxic and transgenic models. Toxic models are basically uh, those models in which you use a toxin, which is selectively toxic to nigrosoidal neurons that we've seen already in PTP. We've seen uh, 6-hydroxydob. I mean, we mentioned rodenone and paraguat, which, which are pesticides. Uh, which, which can increase the risk of developing Parkinson's disease in, uh, in workers, but in, uh, these are also toxins that are widely used to replicate PD features in animals. And we have transgenic models, and these are obviously the, the newest one because they have been generated after the, 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 uh, the discovery of the genetic forms of Parkinson's disease in which you overexpress or knock out a protein depending on what uh, in, uh, type of specific uh, P, uh, genetic PD you want to, to replicate. So this is just a, a, a brief list of the main toxic models uh, used to, to re replicate PD and PTP that we have seen already, which works. Or, uh, yeah, and PTP probenicid is a, is a, is a variant of, of the MPTP uh, model, which basically uh, serves just to prolong, to, to make the effect of MPTP uh, stronger because it uh, um, uh, decreases the clearance of, of, of MPTP, and you can use them in monkeys or in mice, not in rats, because rats are insensitive to, to MPTP. Rodenone and paraquat, which are used in, uh, in rats. And then toxins that can be locally infused, MPTP, uh, MPP plus, sorry. And most of all, 6-hydroxydopamine, uh, which is old, which is simple, but, but which is still probably uh, the most frequently used toxin to replicate uh, Parkinsonian uh, features, uh, at least in uh, in rats, and this is just two ideas of how a, a, a striatum and an nigra uh, show in an animal. This is a monkey that receive MPTP uh, through an intracarotid injection uh, of the right side. You see here that the TH signal has completely disappeared compared to the left unaffected side, and this is a t the, the um, uh, uh, almost historical uh, picture by, by Rangida Bedarbe of the group of Tinker and Meyer who published this paper in 2000, showing that rodenone, if given in uh, chronically, can give you this sort of uh, um, nigrocidal damage. So damage of dopaminergic terminals in the striatum and cell bodies in the nigra, in addition to the, the presence of the formation of cytoplasmic inclusion. Uh, and that was a very popular paper because it was the first paper showing that in an animal model of Parkinson's disease, before the transgenic models uh, um, came into the chip picture, you could actually have the formation of uh, inclusions. And this is the, the old, uh, let me just put this because I, I work with this and I love this, uh, this model very much because it's simple, it's an in inexpensive, it is not uh, complicated, uh, not very fashionable probably, but it's very uh, reproducible and very, and very precise. Transgenic model, on the other hand, um, this is the, 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 the new frontier of um, uh, animal research for, for Parkinson's disease. Uh, like I said, uh, models in, in which you overexpress uh, synuclein, for example, either the uh, wild type uh, uh, form of synuclein or the mutated form of synuclein, or you knock out other um, uh, proteins which are mutated in the genetic forms of PD because these are uh, mutations that cause a loss of function in the protein. The uh, good thing about these models is that by using genetic models, basically you can explore 
all the um, more uh, precise mechanisms that possibly underlie the disease. Because these, these proteins, we mentioned Parkin, we mentioned Pink One, we mentioned DJ1, um, Synuclein, of course, all these uh, proteins uh, affect um, crucial uh, cellular mechanisms that are involved in PD pathogenesis. So, so by using the transgenic models, you actually have the chance to study in, uh, in very refined details of these mechanisms. The problem is about, about uh, the uh, transgenic models is that you can have, uh, for example, uh, with the uh, synuclein models, also the formation of uh, Lewy body-like inclusions, but you do not have uh, a really massive or um, reproducible uh, cell loss, so neuronal damage, which is uh, something that you uh, do not want, for example, if you are testing uh, a new drug. So when I said that you need to know exactly what you're looking for, I said this, that, for example, when you use toxic model, you know that the pros of the toxic model are that you have a consistent uh, nigrostatal degeneration, a good replication of motor symptoms, particularly in the MPTP-treated monkeys. Monkeys uh, intoxicated with MPTP, they develop Parkinson's disease, which is almost uh, identical to the, to the human um, disease. On the other hand, you do not have a consistent body formation, although uh, the group of Greenmeyer show that with rodenon you can have the formation of body like inclusions, but other groups uh, could not actually able to, to replicate this, this finding. And for some models, rodenon, again, you have a high individual variability. While for transgenic models, uh, like, like we said, you can have really beautiful insights into specific selected molecular aspects of the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease, particularly, of course, for the uh, familial forms. And you can have the formation of body-like inclusions, uh, and this applies, of course, to the model using uh, transgenic synuclein uh, animals. The cons, um, so the limitation of the models is that you do not have a consistent or remarkable neuronal damage in the nigrocidal pathway. And like I said, it, this is not good if you want to, to test a new, a new drug, for example. So if you want to test a new neuroprotective compound, first you, have, you must have a real lesion. And then you can, you can say whether the compound or the stem cell that you are mm, transplanting are modifying that lesion. If you are not sure that your model is actually giving uh, the animal a lesion, then there is no point in using that model. On the other hand, if you, if you want to um, dissect uh, some very refined mechanisms, particularly those uh, um, uh, referring to the mitochondrial uh, uh, dynamics. In that case, uh, it is better if you can have access to a transgenic model. So this is just the, 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 to give you the, uh, the basic message of, uh, of this talk is that we definitely need to know more about the disease if we want to, to cure it. Otherwise, there's no way we will be able to, to find new therapeutic intervention. And this guy actually is helping a lot in, in funding uh, PD research, Michael J. Fox and Mohamed Ali. Grazie.